And joining us now on the line from New York City is Paul Tuff. He is an editor at the New York Times Magazine and author of Whatever It Takes. And Paul, it's good of you to join us on the line tonight from New York. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Good. Let's just talk about post-Katrina education. And I want to start with an excerpt from a piece you did for the New York Times Magazine. It goes like this about New Orleans. New Orleans' disastrously low-performing school system was almost entirely washed away in the flood. That's Katrina, of course. Many of the buildings were destroyed, the school board was taken over, and all the teachers were fired. What is being built in its place, you tell us, is an educational landscape unlike any other, a radical experiment in reform. Give us the overview. What's that experiment like? Well, in most cities, there's a school system. And the way they describe it now in New Orleans is that there's a system of schools. Um, after the school system was washed away, the state took over basically education in the city as a whole and started recreating a system, sort of one school at a time. Right now, um, it, it's what they call a portfolio model. So there is something called the Recovery School District, which runs a few schools. There's another school board that runs a few more schools. And then more than half of the kids in the city are attending charter schools um, that are sort of affiliated with the state but are run independently. Give me your best definition of a charter school. Well, a charter school is um, run on public funds. It's not a private school, but it's run independently. So a private group will apply for a charter, usually a nonprofit group, will apply for a charter, usually applying to the state and saying, you know, we think we can run this school better than, uh, better than the public school, the regular public school system can. Um, and some of the, public, the charter schools in uh, the United States right now are, are quite successful. On, on the whole, they've got a mixed record, but there are a few that are real standouts. Well, it's, it hasn't been that long since Katrina, so can you tell whether the jury is in yet as to whether or not all of these changes are having a positive impact? Well, the one thing that people down there say is that um, things are better now than they were before the storm, but they, they also uh, quickly say that that's setting the bar really low. Before Katrina, it was um, a pretty terrible school system. Uh, it was um, very segregated. The, the public school system was almost entirely African-American. All the white kids in the city had, had mostly left uh, by the time Katrina happened. Um, it was underfunded. What I've heard is that there were teachers who were underqualified and um, a lot of corruption in the system as well. Uh, so it's better than that. Um, so far, though, the, the, you know, the test scores are not much better. They haven't improved. They've improved a little bit, but not a whole lot. Um, but my sense is that things are absolutely heading in the right direction. It's just a, a much better run school system. There are, um, it's kind of become a mecca for people, uh, especially young people interested in education and new, especially new kinds of education. So all of these um, educational hotshots are flocking to New Orleans to start schools, teach in schools. Um, so on the whole, it's got a much better feel than it did before. Well, give me a sense of some of the basics here. I mean, is there still one large teachers union that represents every teacher in the city and do they sign multi-year contracts and can they shut down the system if they want to strike? How about all of that? No, none of that. None of that. Um, so after the storm, uh, basically when the school system was wiped out, the state nullified the contract. They said basically all the teachers are fired because there are no students to go to these schools, there are no schools for them to go to. Um, and then in, as they recreated the system, they did it without collective bargaining. So it's the reason why teachers unions across the country are looking at New Orleans with some uh, level of fear and concern, uh, because if, if indeed there's a, uh, it's a model for public education in the United States, as some people say it should be, it's a model basically without a teachers union. Hmm. Um, so that said, you know, it, it, it's actually become a very popular place to teach. Teachers are paid more than they were before. There's a lot more money in the system than there was. Um, and for the first time this year, uh, this September, there were more teachers applying for positions than there were positions. It, it, it's sort of become a hot place to teach, even though there's not a collective bargaining. And no centralized curriculum either, I guess, eh? In some schools, there's a centralized curriculum. This is where, this is where it gets very confusing. In that recovery school district, which is, still runs about 40% of the schools, um, there is a centralized curriculum, and it's actually something that they um, they emphasize. Uh, but each of the charter schools is allowed to run things exactly the way they want. Hmm. Now, New Orleans, of course, faces special challenges because of the terrible weather-related disasters that they had there. But let's broaden the discussion and talk about how common the situation is there. They, have, they of course, have a disproportionately high uh, African-American student body and a disproportionately high uh, low-income family student body. 
So how common is the problem of student underachievement in most big American cities that you've been able to find? It's very common. I think, I think New Orleans might, might be the worst. It might be its own special case. But um, certainly in New York, where I live, but in lots of other cities in Detroit and Baltimore and Cleveland, um, in Los Angeles, there is uh, a population, mostly poor, often Hispanic or African American, that uh, is not doing well at all in school. Um, there is an achievement gap between how well both black kids and white kids are doing, but also uh, poor kids and middle class kids. Um, and that achievement gap is true um, across the country. Hmm. We know here in Toronto, we hear stories often about uh, low income, mostly immigrant families where English is a second language and uh, there are difficulties associated with trying to get education in, in that regard. What are the sort of typical challenges that an average underachieving student faces in a big American city? Well, there's a lot of challenges. I mean, uh, uh, in my research, what, the way that I've kind of divided it up are the challenges that they face outside of school and the challenges that they face inside school. So let's start with outside school. Um, most uh, low-income kids are being raised by parents who themselves don't have a great education, uh, who might, may have dropped out of college. I mean, may have dropped out of high school. Uh, they have, um, you know, they're, they're moving around a lot. They don't have great food to eat. They don't have a great place to live. And what that means is that they often, especially in the first few years of life, don't get the kind of educational um, stimulation that a middle class and upper middle class kids get. So when they arrive in kindergarten, they're already well behind their peers in terms of how well they can identify letters, how well they can um, do basic uh, computations. Um, and then the problem gets worse. So once they arrive in kindergarten behind, then they usually enter a school system that in, a, in most American cities is, is really not geared towards catching them up. Um, they're often it's just sort of assumed that they can't learn, uh, and they're tracked into low achievement um, programs. Uh, and as their school career goes on, for the most part, they fall further and further behind. Well, I'm assuming that much of what you've described is related to poverty. And my suspicion is there's not a heck of a lot that a school can do to alleviate poverty in someone's home. Is that fair? Well, it is fair. I don't think there's much that a school can do to alleviate poverty. but. There are a number of schools that exist now here, um, not a very big number, but a significant number, um, that are proving that it's possible to, for, for a child from a, a low-income home to achieve at a very high level, even though the poverty remains in their home. So um, th there are certain charter schools, including some of the ones in New Orleans now, um, and some of the ones in Harlem that I've been studying, that are. Um, that are getting scores from kids from, from poor homes without parents with a great education. Um, and by using more intensive methods, uh, they're able to give their kids a very solid education. Well, I've seen a couple of things in your pieces that are you know, pretty simple. I mean, it starts with putting them in a uniform and getting them to sign a covenant saying they're going to show up at school on time every day. I mean, does it really start that simply? Yeah, I mean, I think, that, I think that's part of it. I think in some ways, um, I think, I think that's important because it's important to get the, the family on board and get the student to believe that people care about him and people actually care about him showing up in school. Um, but even more simple than that, I think one thing that a lot of these successful schools have in common is that they simply spend more time um, in the classroom and on education as a whole than most schools do. So most of these uh, successful schools have an extended year and an extended day. They often have after school tutoring. They have sessions on Saturdays. Um, the premise being that when kids arrive, especially if they arrive in, in middle school and junior high um, behind their middle class peers, they need extra help in order to catch up. But mm -hmm. there are, so, so that's part of it. And then one thing that's common to a lot of these schools as well is that they they focus on non-cognitive skills, um, as the economists say as well. So that in, in addition to teaching math and teaching reading, their premise is that kids, especially, especially kids you know, who have gotten to 10 or 11 or 12 without this kind of intensive education, are missing some um, basic ideas about you know, sitting still and concentrating and just that there's a point to education and that there's a possibility that they might succeed and that people around them care about them succeeding. Um, and so it's interesting in these schools that there's, there's a lot of sort of hardcore nuts and bolts education going on, but there's also a lot that's, that 
that has to do with character, really. Gotcha. Now, to the extent that uh, some of our viewers may have followed the education wars in the United States, they may have heard of this law called the No Child Left Behind Law, which George, uh, George W. Bush brought in. Uh, just give us the bare bones of what that law is supposed to do. So that law was passed in 2002, and it, um, it basically established a very ambitious goal, which was that in 14 years, um, every child in the United States would be performing at a proficiency level as, as marked on state tests. Um, and there were certain benchmarks that every state had to meet along the way. Uh, one of the things that was most, turned out to be most important about the law was that for the first time it disaggregated the data so that instead of a, a school just being able to say, oh yeah, you know, 80% of our kids are performing on grade level, we're doing really well, they had to also report how well um, African American kids, Hispanic kids, uh, kids who were learning English as a second language, and low income children were doing. Uh, and the reality was that in a lot of schools, even successful schools, those kids were not doing well at all. And so now, in order to meet uh, the state standards, every child, every, every subgroup in the school has to be doing well. So what the law, the law, the law has lots of problems, and, and in lots of ways it, it hasn't succeeded, but the one thing that it has accomplished is that it's put this new attention on these achievement gaps. Um, and put more of a premium on figuring out ways to raise the achievement of poor kids and African-American kids. Um, mm. and, and in a way, that's led to a lot of these educational innovations that, that I'm writing about. Let's, and well, let's finish up on that. We've got a few minutes left here, and I want you to tell us a bit about what Jeffrey Canada's up to with his Harlem Children's Zone project. What's that all about? Well, um, that is the project that I've been following for the last five years. So in some ways, it's the one that I, that I know the most about and I think is actually most important. What's different about what he's doing than what a lot of these charter schools are doing is that he's combining both um, educational supports and social supports. So he has, uh, at the center of his program, charter schools like a lot of these other high-performing charter schools, extended day, extended year, intensive methods, a lot of focus on reading and math. Um, but then in addition, he, he does believe that, that schools alone have a really difficult time compensating for poverty and the obstacles that a disadvantaged kid faces. So he has uh, a program for parents, um, encouraging them to read to their kids more, to learn basic techniques that are going to give the child cognitive stimulation early on. He's got a pre-kindergarten program that is all day as well and targeted to low-income families in Harlem. And then once the child gets into the school, which goes from kindergarten through grade 12, um, there are lots of additional supports, after-school tutoring, um, family counseling, uh, job counseling, all sorts of things that are supposed to imitate the kind of cocoon of support that middle class kids have from birth um, and, and thus propel them all the way to college. And you've also written about this other program called the KIPP program, K-I-P-P, -P, Knowledge is Power program. What's yes. that about? Well, uh, when I'm talking about those high performing charter schools, KIPP is right at the center of that. They were really the first one to create this model, the extended day, extended year, character education, um, intensive focus. Uh, and they now have 60 schools, I think, across the country. Um, and not everyone has been successful, but a, a really high percentage has been successful. And what I think they're showing by, by this franchise model is that these methods are applicable um, to lots of different kids in lots of different cities. And what's the relationship between these special programs and the public school system? Are they affiliated in any way? Well, they're, they're charter schools, so they are um, publicly funded but uh, run separately from the public school system. And in some cities and states, there's an acrimonious relationship between the, the charter schools and the public schools. Um, people say that the charter schools are taking funding away from public schools uh, and creaming off some of the, the best low-income students. But in lots of cities, uh, and, and increasingly uh, in, in cities like New York and New Orleans and Washington, D.C., um, the superintendents of schools are really embracing charter schools and I think what they have decided um, is that charters are going to help them raise the achievement level of students all over the city. And in our last 30 seconds here, have you been able to make a judgment yourself as to whether the KIPP program or the Harlem Children's Zone is a better way to educate the hardest to educate? Well, I think they're both good and I think that, that there's enough 
uh, enough kids who need help here that um, we need them both. But to my mind, the reason that I think the Harlem Children's Zone is, is more important and, and will be more influential is that it expands beyond just a school. Um, it says that kids need support right from birth uh, all the way through college. And to me, that's going to be a, a more broadly applicable model. And we invite people to check out Whatever It Takes, which is your latest book on this effort, Paul. Uh, good of you to join us tonight on the line from New York City. Paul Tuff from the New York Times Magazine. Thanks very much.